Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniela Foster, and with this panel, we're actually going to get down and talk about local innovation. So we're switching gears a little bit here. How many of you in the room here are from DC? OK. Becca, yeah, we got gotcha. you. So quite a bit. So what some of you may know and some of you may not, but we're going to touch base a little bit on, is DC is one of the wealthiest regions in the country. Yet in some wards, one out of every three children live below the poverty line, and more than 40% of the population is classified as low income. We lead the nation in bike lanes. Some of you may have come here today on those bike lanes. Yet we also have epidemic levels of HIV AIDS infection, obesity rates, and infant mortality rates. Our city has more residents with graduate and professional degrees than any other given our size. You may have seen some of the fun rankings that come out every year. But we also have as the nation's worst high school graduation rates. So one of the things that's needed here is local community innovation. We need a new outlook on problem solving. We need a community-driven outlook. And we need some bold ideas to tackle these problems and promote healthy communities. So Adrian Thompson, here to my left, is one of those innovators doing just that through his work with Young Doctors DC. So we're going to have a chat about that. But I want to first introduce Adrian to you a bit. So he's one of the founders of Young Doctors DC. It's a program that invests in youth to help expose them to careers in healthcare. The program provides young men with intensive training and exposure to the health field and empowers them to tackle pressing health challenges in their communities, and it provides them with hands-on experience. So Anish just talked about um, blood, uh, blood pressure screenings in churches. Well, that's one of the things that this program does. They do a number of really cool free health clinics in their communities. So Adrian is just wrapping up his PhD in clinical psychology from Howard University. And he was a Ronald E. McNair doctoral fellow. Um, he's very passionate about African-American youth and their families. And we're going to just kick it off. The first question I have for you, Adrian, is you know, Young Doctors DC is a Bright Ideas in a Challenge Innovation Award winner. Um, you're a success coming out of the, the DC Social Innovation Project. Why did you choose to focus on the health and medical sector. So, you know, why why doctors and what makes Young Doctors DC a unique model? Well, <clears throat> we, we wanted to, first off, we wanted to look at how we can help our community, right? And so some of those numbers that you mentioned are, are indeed staggering and, and it's an issue that we've done a lot of thinking about. And so when we start thinking about how we how we tie the issue of trying to help communities with how we try to help, you know, some of our youth. The idea was like, well, then how can we how can we help our youth and in, at the same time engage multiple people to help them, thus giving them something to help as well. And so, looking at the healthcare sector is like, well, that's that's one of these problems that we try to try to solve. And we started talking and we started doing some thinking, and we realized that you you know there's a good chance that if we increase the number of African American doctors, right, maybe we can increase that engagement, right, in the community and going back and forth. So we started with this idea of trying to build you know, kind of engagement with youth and saying, well, let's try to solve a problem while doing that. And so the, the doctor piece, the bringing the young men into the healthcare fields is really to try to, you know, give us this, this entry point right back into the community. That's great. So you, you've been through the process of taking an idea. You had this idea formed with your co-founders and then developing the concept into something that has tangible community impact. For some of the folks in this room that may have an idea and you know, want to make something happen, what are the three major lessons learned or best practices that you can share with this group on how to successfully design incubate and grow a model that will drive authentic community change? Yeah, I, first off, you've, you've got you've to define your population and what you're trying to do, right? And young doctors, you know, we, I say that best define it, right? And, and when we think of it like research, like it's like really kind of trying to systematically get down to what we're looking for. So young doctors kind of has like maybe three 
like kind of three parts for this population. One of them, of course, is the young black men that we're working with. Another one is this medical pipeline, kind of this student model, and then the community, right? But what, what the last you know, four or five years have taught us is that we have to better, better define that even more, right? So we've had to try to hone in that population particularly. We've had, and and each, each time we do it, each iteration of that thought kind of cleans up that idea for us. So at first we would have said, and we did say, okay, young black men's from War 7 and War 8, right? And that was it, right? And so what we found was that there are several institutional issues that kind of challenged us, or once we got those kids, kind of moving them through. And so we had to, you know, kind of, you know, make that a little bit more sophisticated. When we said, okay, the community, we had to do the same thing. Because like you said, not all of DC is struggling with these health disparities, right? So we had to think about where we were doing that as well. And then this pipeline, which I think is getting a lot of the thought, you know, kind of where they fit within the high school, undergraduate, graduate level. We had to kind of, kind of really kind of fine tune that. So really defining your population was one thing that, that we had to do. The second piece is find, find partnerships, you know, make partnerships or find partners who are invested or have a vested interest in what we're trying to do. So we've been extremely um, successful and lucky to have these partnerships. We've partnered with AAMC. We've partnered with SMDEP, which is a, a kind of a summer um, medical and dentist program that, that's, that's run nationwide, but there's one chapter in, at Howard University. We've partnered with uh, local churches. Um, we partnered with Howard University where, where the students get to stay for the summer. And all of them have a vested interest in either developing young, young people to the health careers and or like with AAMC, getting their, their number of, of applications up and, young, and doctors in. So, so, so along the way, we are able to kind of say, well, look, we're trying to work this program. And then you know, AAMC will say, we're trying to do this. Or SMDP will say, we're trying to do this. Or Howard University will say, we're trying to do this. And so we get to bring everything up. And then the last thing I think is really, really understanding what the landscape of change should be or, or what we're expecting, right? And so initially we said, well, hey, we, you know, we probably have one of these lofty um, goals that, that all you know, high school or you know, high school enrichment programs have like 100% graduation rates or all of our kids are accepted into colleges. And those things are you know, great outcomes of a program, right? But before we get there, we have to say, well, what is it that we're actually getting along the way, right? And what we found is that, you know, starting with just saying, I got a group of kids and I want to get them to high school, or to graduate from high school, or I've got a group of kids, I want them to apply to college, or I got a group of kids, I want them to make it all the way to medical school, those are great numbers for funders, right? For, for, for kind of sound bites or things like that. But then there's so many things that take you know, that, that, have, that have to happen for that young person to just get to graduation, right? And we hadn't, we hadn't thought about it that much because it was just an outcome. Everybody's gonna graduate. We're gonna put these things in place and then they're gonna graduate. So what we had to do was say, well, what does that landscape of change looks like? What it would look like? What does it mean to actually grab a young person in this environment and, and cultivate and nurture them to graduation? What does it mean to have them make that very big transition that we're finding? from high school to college, right? What does it mean to, to ensure that they make it through their first two years? Because there's a lot of research that says if by their freshman year they haven't hit a number, a number of credits, you know, that, that graduation rate's going to decrease, right? We also, there's a lot of research that says that African-American men in, 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 uh, specifically, you know, enroll in STEM programs in college, but almost, you almost, you lose a large percent of them by graduation. Not, not dropping out of college, but leaving that STEM field. Right, and then you go all the way to you know the current reports that are coming out um, about doctors and matriculants of, uh, of medical schools, and, and you're still you're representing three or you know, two to three percent, but there's less doctors or less African American people, men applying to schools, medical schools right now than there were in 1978. Right, so you have to figure out kind of at each level what that change will look like, and it helps you kind of get that. And sometimes it's about lowering back from those really lofty, nice sounding goals, like 100% graduation rate or 100% kind of enrollment rate and say, well, look, we, we want to engage them, you know, 100% on our Saturday academies. We want them to in, in, engage in the, in the community this much. We want them to gain these experiences because that'll help them on those goals, right? And I think that a lot of our students, we've got a, a class of graduating seniors now, a lot of those students, you know, are going to graduate. However, they've gained so many other skills. So if I just said, hey, we've got this percentage of graduation, it sounds nice, but I can tell you probably 20 other things that all these young men have accomplished 
just to get here. And it's, and it's the first exit point of our, of, our, of our program. So Adrian, over lunch, we were having a really fascinating conversation and I wanna bring the audience in on this a bit. So you were telling me about the, the power of the lab coat, the power of even just putting on a doctor's coat. And so I think the audience would really benefit from hearing you talk a little bit about that story and also tie in, you know, why why doctors? You could have done a, a pipeline education college program for kind of anything, any field. Um, why doctors? And what's the power of that lab coat? Yeah. So I one of my research interests is I do a lot of work um, with the psychophysiology. Right. And so I do a lot of kind of like the physiological representations of stress, the physiological representations of racism, things like that. And one of the if you hop into that literature, the first thing you know is that anytime somebody walks into a space and somebody has a lab coat, right, your heart rate, your your your, your things are reacting to that. Right. So there's a physiological response to seeing somebody in a white coat. Like just it's just a natural like the baseline. You're, you're fine. Your doctor walks in no matter what he's about to tell you, it kicks up. Right. And so this idea of imagery and icons that people have to surround themselves with is huge. And so what we started to think about and what we were talking about over lunch is that what does it mean for a young black man in these areas that we're get, um, getting them from? What does it mean to put on this white coat? Because the first thing is they'll put that white coat on even at medical school. When, when, when the doctors, the first year doctors put that white coat on, they're not doctors. Right. But they're they're going to take on the culture of medicine. They're going to take on the culture of learning how to become a doctor, how to represent themselves with the respect and the authority that that white coat gives, right? And so we're doing the same thing with our young men. We're putting that, we, and we just had, you know, and we just inducted another class, and we, we, we have a white coat ceremony. They put that on, and that, that, that first, uh, that putting it on, they have now, in, you know, added themselves to a culture that has had people already do some work for them. Right. And it's about seeing themselves past what might be their traditional trajectory. Right. So they might say before, you know, I'm thinking about maybe trying to get some good grades, graduating, maybe going to a two year community college, maybe not, maybe working right after. But if you put this code on and what we're forcing them to think about is at least eight to 12 years in the future. Right. A reality that we're training you today and to be honest with stuff that you're not going to use for eight years. I mean, you're going to use it in the community health fairs and the things like that. You're going to be able to, to, to wow your friends and talk to your grandma about her blood pressure. But you're not going to be able to turn it into a profit for yourself. You're not going to be able to do these things that are going to sustain you. But culturally, and, 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 and they're, they're invoking this idea of belonging, this sense of, of professionalism, that that's one of those unmeasurables. Like, what is the effect of having that and how you feel about yourself when you have this white coat on? And we like to have said it extends to, to not just having the coat on, right? Our, our young men, when they go out into the community or the shadowing doctors in, in the hospitals, they actually get treated like doctors, right? If they're in a community fair and they're doing blood pressure and, you know, we have, you know, our, our doctors supervising them, but they say, oh, wow, you have high blood pressure. When's the last time you saw your physician? That, that conversation is so organic and so natural that the, they're, they're fitting right in and we're getting more information and they're gaining, you know, kind of this confidence that when I, when I, when I leverage it for them to do the same thing at school, to do the same thing socially, it's not a new, a new idea. So when I say, look, I need you to go talk to your teacher because you're struggling in this class, we've modeled that, right? We've modeled how do you deal with difficult situations? How do you deal with things? And it's, and it's because they've started to take on a persona that's that's extending past short-term goals and the long-term goals. So I think the, 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 the imagery of the white coat and what it means to developing our young men and, just the, and, and healthcare professionals just says, I'm doing something now that's going to invest in my future. So one of the other things I wanted to touch on, and we talked a little bit about this over lunch, so I hope this is fair game, Adrian. But you you were talking about um, we talked a little bit about preventative health, and I want to switch over to that a bit. So thinking about habits, um, how we improve healthcare, how we possibly move from a system of just treatment towards a system that actually looks at prevention. Um, that means people actually have to go to the doctor for preventative care, and so you had touched a little bit on some of the barriers to that and how um, young doctors DC may actually help with that yeah exactly I mean like that's 
So when we talk about our community focus, that, that is the crux of it. The, the, the crux of that community focus is creating what, what the research called health navigators, right? And so in certain cultures, in, in an African-American culture, um, especially in, in our communities, there's, there, there's just there, there are low numbers of African-Americans that go to doctors to see the primary care for physicians that, you know, have medical compliance, things like that. And so we, we again, in our thinking, we we're like, well, how do we get that? And there's in the research, health navigators are kind of like paraprofessionals that kind of lead the way. Right. And so what we thought and what we've seen is that by making our young men able to be able to go into the community, give you know, give blood pressures to their grandmothers or their, the people in their community, the people at church, and say, you might need to go to your primary care physician. That's something that they, they trust that person. They know that person. Matter of fact, they might have, you know, I've known you since, okay, fine, you, you're bringing me something that, that I've heard before, right? But, from a, but the messenger might have been out of, you know, out of the scope of somebody I should listen to. And so now the messenger is somebody who, one, I know, right? I'm really invested in, and I want to invest in their future. And it almost is like kind of co-opting that investment. Like if you want to invest in my future, you have to invest what I'm saying. And, and that's, that means that a lot of times turning around and going to ask your, 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 your primary care physician. We have a great story of one of our young docs, um, uh, Marcus Wilson, who you know is well known? I mean, he's just well known in his community, but throughout D.C., it's just a unique kind of thing. If wherever we're at, somebody's going to walk up to him and say, "Hey, what's going on?" Right? And so he was in his community walking around, and somebody came to him, and they were dizzy. Well, I'm not feeling too good, I, but you know, I, I know you've got some kind of knowledge. And he was able to, you know, pull out his, you know, his blood pressure cuff, put it on there, notice that it was high. He tied us in, tied her in with, with our professionals. They tied her in with her, you know, healthcare professionals, and they've got her the assistance that she needs, right? And that's what we're trying to do. Like, we, with that loop, we know that, that there's this, you know, kind of, I talk about it as this kind of cultural mistrust in the African-American community oftentimes that we see, and that's what the research talks about a lot. And I was, I was explaining to you, and I was explaining to another colleague the other day, that it's not necessarily that I have this knowledge of these things that might have happened. Right, but I have a narrative that was told to me. Right, I have a I have a, of a cultural practice that I've learned, and that cultural practice, what we were talking about, is we don't go to doctors. I don't know why; it's just something we don't do. Or I don't, you know, okay, yes, yeah, so I've got a pain in my foot, but I'll wait. You, you know, and what we want to do is really try to attack that that narrative. We want to attack that kind of you know kind of learning that way they have, and say, well, you got something on your foot. And you have diabetes, maybe you should go see a doctor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, or are you you're feeling the pain? What is that? But maybe you should go. You know, and 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 leading the way. on, look, look. Okay, you don't you don't have a health you know primary care physician. You don't know that. Let's come through this way, and we can try to find you know kind of a solution for you. So that's a big focus of what we're trying to do. So when I used to work on public-private partnerships at the State Department, one of the things I used to always say was, when you're trying to kick something off. Um, start small, but think big. And so my question for you is, um, can, can the Young Doctors DC model be scaled? Will we see Young Do Doctors DC in New York City or in LA? I know you had mentioned you're doing some things in New Jersey. What does that look like? And how scalable is this? Is this something that folks in the audience could pick up and do in their communities? So yes, we believe definitely that it's scalable. Definitely we want to see it expand outside of DC. Um, and so to that end, what we what we are doing right now is building kind of what I said earlier, kind of looking at the landscape and seeing what that landscape, the change is doing. So, you know, we've got, you know, we've got our logic model together. We're talking about outputs, our inputs, things like that. And when we start measuring those things, it's not necessarily the kids. It is the kids that we're focusing on, but the inputs, the outputs, the outcomes are large scales. And this is a nationwide, you know, nationwide problem both on every level. So from mentorship of young black boys to you know, matriculation in the, the, to, to, to college and into com community engagement, each place, is a na there's a national need for that. And so what we're really trying to do is really start collecting data, really starting to, to kind of you know, disseminate through that kind of stuff, kind of write up some papers, look at some studies. We've created several um, curriculums for the summertime in the Saturday academies with, base, uh, with a lot of outcomes. We're tracking grades and you know out uh, you know graduation rates at this time. So yes, we do see that it could that we want it to expand, 
but we, you know, what we also know is that we, you know, you have to have that structure and that foundation, right? Because what we don't want to have, and, and that's what we work a lot to do, we don't want to have our vision kind of lost in this, getting sucked up in this a larger machine, which is, that speaks to like the, the number of kids we take, right? We take kind of cohorts of four or five kids, right? It looks more like what you would see in more of a, like a PhD grad program than an incoming medical school class. And the reason that we do that is because we want a, a tighter knit of um, kids, right? A tighter knit of communications and learning. Um, and so that's one of the things that we find these small classroom settings that you know, there are several programs that are, that are similar in nature, but they do a little, they have a larger scope. They bring a lot of kids. And when you do that, you know, in, in, in our opinion, you have to make a kind of a, you have to have to have to have a cut line, right? Like when, when are you no longer kind of the most effective in our group, right? And so what we want to do is, you know, kind of lower that coat line or bring everybody above it. And to do that, we want to have smaller groups and look at it. And so that's the kind of thing that we're really trying to think about is how when you make this a national model, right, is it small groups that work and what's the research? You know, how does that differ from large groups? The mentoring piece is the huge piece, right? Like, and, and, and we are a young group. And so a lot of the initial uh, people who work on it on the ground have thus moved elsewhere. This is why we're, we're doing work in New Jersey and New York. This is why we, we do kind of more expanded work because that's where our founders are moving to, right? Um, and so there's, a, there's definitely an idea of creating that. We think that you can do that, um, but our goal is to make sure that we, we get that essential program first, and then we can try to expand it. So what's the most surprising thing that you've noticed so far, kind of going from idea through to implementation and a program, and you now have your cohorts, and you're really pinpointing what you think works and what it's the best model of change and you're doing train the trainer things. What's been the most surprising um, element that's come out of this? I would say, I would say the actual mentoring pipeline, like the effectiveness of it, right? And so it's, it's, a, it's a point of bragging for us now that our young men have been in every hospital in DC, right? They know, they've, they've witnessed surgeries, they've been in the ER rooms, they've been in trauma hospitals, um, they've been taught by some of, you know, those medical students that go in the medical schools in DC. They know, you, you know, there's a, there's a few number of black or African American deans of medical school, they know all of them. They've been to medical schools, they know them. And so, but at every point, the acceptance that, of the mentor pipeline, there's not a, not a place that we take these young men and they're not accepted, and in turn, the doctors want to work with us. The, the missions departments want to work. And so like, there are tons of barriers to complete this process. But what's surprising or which, what's you know, motivating uh, for, for us is that we say that, look, it's, it's a pipeline that we have multiple players that we want to get on board. Those players also want to work with us, right? And so that's, it's not surprising because you'd like to think it, but to actually see it. Right, that actually, it help, helps us say that we're on our right, the right path because we have these partnerships and they have these vested interests and, and they want to continue working with us, which then in turn gives us value to our young men. Which means those young men can then go to a trauma, a trauma hospital and have tons of people take time out of their day to spend two hours with them. And then on the way home, they're like, wow, I just met so-and-so. He was coming out of surgery and he had all this stuff on, but he spent time with me. That's, an, that's part of the narrative they don't see, right? They, a lot of kids will say, nobody really cares about us. And to say, not only do we have, you know, people at the DC level working with them and medical students and some doctors locally, you know, I know people and they have, like we're, we're talking about college for a lot of kids. They have people in their Rolodex that they can, okay, well, so-and-so, they went to Georgetown, they went to Delaware State, they went to, and, and so they, not only do they have this culture that they, they've kind of taken on with the white jacket, they have this extended culture where saying, well, I know people who've done this, they look like me, right? And they want me to reach out to them. So we've got one young man who is just a networker, right? So like if he was here, he would have probably shaken every one of your hands and like, hey, I'm gonna be a, you know, I'm gonna be a surgeon one day, right? But like, because of that, he has willed himself into positions that, that just you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have thought about for him when we saw when you met him as a tenth grader, you know. And so so that's 
that's that biggest piece is that it, it the acceptance that we're getting in the pipeline, which means that that's, that's a valuable piece of what we do and we're going to try to reinforce that. So speaking of the power of kind of networking, one of the values that I always think these types of events bring is you have everyone in the room and maybe some of you are DC based or interested in these types of pipeline programs. So with that in mind, Adrian, Blue Sky, what's next for you guys? What kind of partners do you need? Who do you want to work with? Where do you guys want to go? Maybe even some information on how folks in the room can get involved if there's interest. I think that would be cool because we have a unique opportunity here to figure out how all these pieces fit together. Yeah, definitely. Um, so like I said earlier, we are really trying to solidify our base, right? Our structure. What does it look like? What is the inputs, the outcomes, you know, outputs? What are we looking for? And, and, and sustain funding, right? And so, so we, we, we're working on those and we're doing that to make sure we can sustain funding and then, and then grow, you know, grow in a, in a way that's not gonna be too fast, but grow in a substantial way that we can make a difference. And so we are, we are looking to partner with um, people to, to increase, you know, more research, more policy work, to influence more policy, to current, turn back and say, this is the things that we are trying to do in the community and then to strengthen that pipeline. So we would like to start transitioning and getting people in place to, to, to strengthen the undergraduate part of our pipeline, to strengthen the medical school part of our pipeline, to strengthen the, um, the post-medical school pipeline, which means that we want to mentor young African-American men across this, this continuum, right? And so we are focused right now with the high school piece and we're trying to work with these other pieces, but we're trying to build, you know, structure and infrastructure with, around bringing those in. And so, in the room, if if you guys are in D.C. or interested in this program, the first thing I always say, right, if you're a medical professional, a doctor, or something like that, you know, reach out to us. You know, come talk to the young men. Do, we have Saturday academies almost every Saturday. We do a summer academy at Howard University every summer, um, and we the the kids have experienced so much from those kind of relationships. And I think then after that, we do always a lot of programming. It's like, well, you know what? I have this other program, or we're trying to increase the number of this. And so, so those, co those collaborations, those communications are always you know, needed and, 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 and wanted and, and just so, so fruitful. Um, but then the other side is that you know, we, we are looking for opportunities to, to expand our community reach, right? Like how do we get, in, how do we get, in, get into the communities that are hard to serve? Right? How do we reach out to you know the people who need the the health services, blood pressure screenings, things like that? Um, and then the the biggest piece and our hardest piece is kind of gaining that access to the young men that we need. Right? You mentioned earlier about the the high school the high school graduation rates. I, I sent you some documents and some facts about you know, you know, reading, average reading for African-American boys, levels of suspension, and then you look at the graduation rate. There's so much stuff that happens that we need to connect prior to high school, right? Like, and, and, and so when we start looking at it, because that's our cutoff right now, we start looking at high school, well, they come packed with all this other issues that are kind of socially based. And so we're trying to figure out how to go around that, you know, or help that or, or intervene earlier um, and those are going to take those partnerships that are community based, that are school based, um, and sometimes the vested interests of some of those things aren't in line, right? And so we've got to try to work with kind of leveling that playing field. Really interesting, and I think I mean a lot of what, what's been talked about here today is is the ecosystem, the various elements that go into health, whether it's tech or patients or just other community, other elements. So I think that's very powerful. So thank you very much, Adrian. Um, we've been enjoyed chatting with you all today. Thank you.